Well, subsequent to my last pill cam teardown, um, courtesy of a uh, gastroenterologist uh, who prefers to remain, remain anonymous, I've got hold of a few more pill cameras. These are the um, uh, the radio type made by a company called Given in Israel. And there's two types here. I don't know whether these are actually different functional types or just different uh, generations. Compared to the mirror cam, they're slightly longer, maybe a couple of millimetres longer. Um, but other than that, the same sort of diameter, same sort of appearance. Um, this one's got a much longer lens, and obviously there's a lot less actually in it if you compare the two. And there's only four LEDs on this, and there's uh, six on this one here. Let's crack them open and take a look. three boards, it's like a flex rigid assembly. This is quite a common technique for cameras and really high density electronics where you have a piece of flex that's actually laminated as part of the layer stack up of a conventional PCB and then there'll be holes plated through. Um, so at this end we've got the lens, lead ring, um, the flex doesn't appear to uh, go across there so there's some other interconnect for the LEDs. Um, sends a bit, we've got the battery connector and this teeny tiny little reed switch. Uh, this will be for switching it on, so when it's in its case before it's deployed, there'll be a magnet in the case that holds that reed switch off. Um, so it turns on when the, uh, the magnet disappears. And on the back, we've got this potted antenna coil. Um, I think this is just a standard coil that's been moulded, probably mostly for mechanical rigidity. And on the back, we have this chip and a crystal and a few passives and that's it. You can actually see there's some tiny little springs that link up to the uh, lead board. Yes, these tiny, tiny little gold-plated springs. They're maybe about a bit under a millimetre in diameter. I'm sure those are a real fiddle to assemble. And then you've just got the lead ring stuck to the lens. Actually, this is actually a conventional 1.6mm thick PCB. It just looks so huge on something this small. It looks sort of enormously thick. Obviously, the, the thickness of the PCB gets the LEDs in the right, the optimum position for lighting. So we've got a tiny little lens in there. And there we've got the imaging chip. Um, this is obviously a custom part because it's got a square aspect ratio. No normal image sensors would be square. They're normally four to three or sixteen to nine ratio. Um, the marking on this um, chip, it's obviously a custom chip, and the first line is actually uh, GIT, which I think stands for Given Imaging Technologies or something similar. And this white one, this is a bit different. Again, I'm not sure if these are just different generations or if there's any functional difference. I mean, the lens looks a bit bigger, maybe they've got a wider aperture on the lens. Plastic battery retainer. And this one's only two boards. They've managed to cram this part of using this small crystal. And the chip on that side, they're using a little small spring contact probe instead of a spring, just presumably to reduce the 
the PCB footprint and you've now got the antenna coil and the reed switch all on the same side so it's now a two board assembly which is obviously going to reduce their manufacturing costs and also the image sensor and the LEDs are also on the same PCB now there's no separate LED board and there's just the plastic lens assembly goes over the top of that so they've effectively reduced a, uh, a four board assembly down to two boards uh, they've not they're not potting this anymore I think probably the main reason for potting this is mechanical stability to keep the uh, the turns in exactly the same place although this one isn't potted it is covered in some sort of resin or glue um, it's possible they might be fine-tuning it by sort of squeezing the turns or it may be that's just how it comes out but the turns aren't quite even um, I believe these work at about four, somewhere in the 400 megahertz band so this is going to be a, like a single chip transmitter but also there'll be probably encoding and a few other bits and pieces all on that chip um, there appears to be about nine or ten conductors in that flex to the uh, the imaging chip. And I think that's the same size. Yeah, the root switch itself is the same size, but the pins have just been formed for a surface mount assembly. And there's all these test points on the back. The other interesting thing that I noticed is there's actually a solder bridgeable link option here. That just looks like a blob of solder, but if you take the solder off, it's actually two pads. So that's some sort of factory link option. I can't really think what option you'd have. I suppose it, well, there's a couple of things. One is it could be, for example, the flash rate, so they could trade off. Um, how often it takes pictures versus battery life or it could be different frequencies for different countries perhaps I don't really know but that's yes yeah, some some sort of link link option there for two different variants or maybe even for testing or something and there's all these other test pads around the outside and um, the batteries they're silver oxide again the only difference between this and the Militan one is instead of using conductive epoxy to stick them together these have actually been um, welded using a little, a little metal strap between them. Right, I've tried a few of these and I've not been able to get any of these to power up. Um, if we stick the magnet on so that it's in its normal off mode, you can see the power consumption drops to almost zero. Um, these reed switches are actually normally open reed switches just because that's the easiest one to manufacture. So there's obviously going to be a switch on there so it takes a tiny amount of current for a pull up when the switch is closed. Then you take the magnet away and all you see is the current jumps up to about 200 microamps very briefly and then drops down and sits at about 60 microamps but there's no sign of any lead flashing um, or anything, it just, it just sits there right, what I suspect is going on here is that there's some mechanism in these things to prevent them being reused obviously these things sell for quite a lot of money, several hundred dollars and because of the way it's cased it would actually be quite practical to physically open the case put new batteries in and reuse them which although may not be the most attractive proposition but particularly in um, less well-off countries where people are paying for health care you know the ability to save a few hundred dollars you know, would be quite welcome so what I think is probably going on is these are arranged such that once they've been used once they then deactivate the question is how might they be doing this? Well, one method obviously they could have some E-squared PROM or non-volatile memory in there, but I don't think that's likely because it, that's a re just to add um, non-volatile memory to a chip is relatively expensive and just for that function there's probably other ways of doing it. Um, what I suspect is the case is that when they're originally powered up in the factory there's some sort of activation sequence that's needed to actually unlock them um, then they stay unlocked while the battery is alive it obviously gets used but once the battery goes flat they then need to be reactivated so the question is how do they do this activation now possibly the most obvious way is using the reed switch because obviously um, your main input to this device is that reed switch so what they could perhaps be doing is applying maybe some special timing sequence to the reed switch um, when the th thing's first powered on to activate it so let's just have a look at what the thing's doing to see if that that looks a plausible possibility
Okay, what I've done is I've connected the signal generator up to the read switch input so the thing can be turned um, on and off so we can apply different patterns to it. So when this top trace is low, that's effectively the magnet being removed. So we see this initial burst of oscillator clock. Um, I think it's pretty fairly reasonable to assume that the oscillator being on means the chip is in, in an active state and able to look at things and when the oscillator goes off it's just going to sleep. I suspect there probably isn't a microcontroller in here. I can't really see why there'd be any need, need for it because all it's doing is it's taking the camera data, encoding it, spitting it out and doing some uh, simple power management. It's almost certainly going to be full custom chip because it's got the RF stuff on there. So it would be as easy to implement all that logic in discrete logic than a microcontroller and probably take up less silicon area and use less power. So if we look at what happens when we adjust the on sign, we can see this is this, is this initial burst that we saw when we just did it manually. And as we t start turning on and off more quickly, what we see is that when it turns off, it turns off pretty much instantaneously. Now, I mean, what, what that suggests to me is that this read switch is pretty much a hard on off switch. And obviously this thing needs to, needs to draw absolute minimum power. So it's, it, it is a normally open read switch so that when the thing is in its deactivated state, that read switch is closed. But I think that almost certainly is literally a, probably a FET switch in there to turn power off to the whole chip to make absolutely sure it's drawing as little power as possible. And it, was, it seems to be well under 0.1 microamp. So what it's, yeah, if this thing was looking for patterns on the read switch, what I would expect to see is this thing to actually stay at that length and then as we reduced it, actually stay on it to actually notice these additional transitions and try and make sense to maybe f for some sort of activation code. But this seems to me to be pretty much a, whatever frequency we give it, it's literally on for when that pulse is active or for, or for its minimum time. So. Um, I suspect it's probably not using that. So, and the reason I thought they might be using the read switch is that if they were using those, for example, those test pads, it would be quite a fiddle to assemble it. They need, you know, it would obviously need some sort of jig to connect the batteries, apply that test signal, and then assemble the thing whilst maintaining the battery contact. But because the batteries are all um, are all sort of spring spring loaded, it would actually be quite difficult to assemble it while maintaining contact with the battery. I suppose there's a it's it's conceivable that it's actually looking at the image sensor but i think that's a bit unlikely just because it's relatively complicated to do it, yeah it would require quite a lot of logic and you know, all this is wanting is an activation and if i were designing this i probably would use maybe try and use the read switch or failing that look for perhaps some sort of crc based si signal on the on the pin so that you give it a signal that's got a, a known crc value that matches to provide an activation which would be pretty much impossible to guess but give you a sort of nice secure activation system well, I was doing a little prodding around with the signal generator, and look, we have some life. Now, I don't know how lucky that was. I'll just do a bit of probing around just in case this is the, this is the only time I ever get it working. But I'll do a bit of prodding around with the signals while it's running, and then take a close look to see if I can figure out what the actual um, activation sequence is. But there was one, what I was seeing was, uh, again, I was just probing the crystal just to use that as an indicator to whether it was actually awake or doing anything and I was just literally sticking the um, SIG gen on these various pads and this one pad, the one near the red wire, red wire I've put on, I noticed the crystal was coming on for quite a lot longer for certain pulses and I was just doing all sorts of random different frequencies and suddenly noticed the light flashing. So let's have a quick probe around this um, while it's running, and then I'll see if I can look in detail to find a more, see if I can find a reliable way of um, activating this thing. Well, you can see the power draw on this while it's running is about 1.8 milliamps, which I think the other one was a little bit higher, about 3 milliamps. So it's interesting the Myrocam one was claiming longer life for lower power draw, but it could be that they were comparing it to an earlier generation of this or something. I'm not really sure, but this looks like it's actually. Uh, um, drawing a bit less power than the uh, Myrocam device. This is with a scope on the end of the antenna coil and we can see a little burst here. I'm guessing um, this bit at the top is the actual transmission so it's quite a short duty cycle transmission. Um, 
Let's see if we can actually trigger and see if we can measure the frequency. This is only a three, 300 meg scope, um, but I would expect it probably has some response at 400 megahertz, so if, I, if only just enough to measure the frequency. Let's see if we can find it. frequency that is and that's yeah it's about 450 megahertz one thought that struck me when I was measuring the, uh, after I measured the frequency of course that um, this is about a 400 megahertz signal and this being a 300 meg scope now of course this looks like quite a nice sine wave but in fact most of that's actually interpolation from the, um, the scope if I actually turn the vectors off you can probably just about see that you only actually get a few dotted points so trying to actually measure the peaks of those isn't actually going to be that meaningful so I think probably the best way to get a more accurate reading of frequency is to just try and fit as many cycles on the screen as possible and just count it over quite a few cycles and divide it just to measure as many as we can so one, two, three, four, 38, 39, 40 okay so we, we've counted 40 cycles there and that's now telling us frequency of 10.858. So if we then multiply that by 40, that gives us a frequency of um, 434.32 megahertz. So that's probably a fairly um, close figure for the actual frequency. So it's just a, a, a thing to be wary of when you're pushing scopes past their nominal uh, specs is to just to be aware of what may look like a nice display is actually um, quite a lot of it is actually lying to you because it's actually just that. Well I think that first power up it got into some slightly weird glitchy mode um, just managed to power it up again um, after I accidentally disconnected it and it seems to be working in more than what I'd expect we're pulling about three and a half milliamps the LEDs look a little bit brighter but also if you look at the transmit waveform we've now got a much longer transmit burst so we've got this this is the transmit burst and then the short gap while it's taking the picture so again that's the um, 450 odd meg carrier on there so let's have a poke around some of the other waveforms and see what we can see all right these are a couple of the waveforms on the test pads in the middle going up to the camera so we've got what looks like a sync signal and this bottom trace is data you can see it looks it's got a complex waveform there. The only other thing of any interest is the clock waveform here, which is running at continuous 2.7 megahertz, which is providing the clock to the image sensor. Right, that data is fairly static. I'm blasting a lot of light at the camera. If I just stick a bit of paper in front of it. As yeah, so I now put a bit of paper in front, you can see the data is all changing. And take it away. I think that's just a static, fully white because it's pointing at a white bench. I think it's just completely saturated. Not quite clear how this is encoded. It's not Manchester. There are quite a lot of transitions there, so this is probably pre encoded for transmission in some format. See, there's, there's more than two different pulse lengths, but you don't get any really, really long lengths, so it's probably an encoding to. Uh, maximize the efficiency over the air and if you look at the overall um, start of the data it's fairly similar to the uh, the mirror cam overall structure and you've got um, a run in here like a preamble which is all the same data then there's a synchronization area and then here we've got the actual image data which you can see is changing it doesn't appear to be a frame count on this one so this is a, obviously a, a fixed pattern over a long time for the um, receiver to set its level and then you've got the synchronization which establishes the uh, the bit bit framing all right so just looking at this activation stuff um, what I was doing when I managed to turn it on um, I was monitoring this top trace is the crystal so I, I figured that the crystal running was a good indicator of it being interested in something doing something so I was just randomly poking the pads I had a signal generator generating a few tens of hertz 
bunged it through a resistor to make sure I wasn't pumping any current anywhere it shouldn't do. Um, and what I was doing is I was poking this and I was watching for stuff happening on this crystal and I found this one pad on the board that whenever it saw an edge we've got this little burst of um, waveform. And after a bit of just general trial and error what I found was that as the pulses get shorter we started seeing these really long bursts of um, oscillator. So what, I, what I'm doing now is I'll just disconnect literally manually connect and disconnect the pulse of the SIG gen so I can just generate individual pulses and if you do it at the right time I found that <clears throat> if you give it one pulse and then let go once you see the uh, the crystal starting it's a bit hard to do with this but there you go when you see the full crystal starting that's when you actually see it flashing but it does seem to have these two modes this is in this mode where it's only drawing um, about 1.8 milliamps and I'm not really sure whether it's the actual pulse width or the number of pulses um, that puts it into its 3 milliamp mode which I think is the proper mode the 1.8 milliamp mode might be something like a transmitter test because it only transmits very short bursts of data um, the other thing I notice is after a while it seems to just stop responding until you cycle the, the read switch and again we see these bursts appearing so I wonder if it may be it's either some combination of either the width or the number of pulses after the read switch cycles gets into it gets into the various different modes. One thing I haven't yet been able to do is actually get it into its shipping condition whereby it, it's switched off with a magnet and then when the magnet comes off it starts working because obviously that's the condition it would be when it leaves the factory so that when the thing's taken out of its box it actually starts working but so this seems to be in a mode where if I stick the magnet on you see the current drops to zero take the magnet off and it's now stuck at this sort of 50-60 microamp level and the only way to activate it is, is to apply that pulse so I'm guessing there's possibly some magic sequence or something you have to apply on that pin to then get it into its you know ready to ship type condition which may involve some more complicated pulses or something which I'd I really can't be bothered to investigate things. I don't really. Uh, I'm not planning on getting the business of refurbishing these things, but uh, there do seem to be a few sort of interesting uh, test modes and so on in there. And managed to get that other two board one working using exactly the same method. I just tried unsoldering that little link on the uh, two board unit. Um, what it seems to do is it just seems to almost randomly skip the odd LED flash. Doesn't seem to be any obvious pattern to it, this one. <coughs> I did check it doesn't change the transmit carrier frequency. Um, and this doesn't really seem to be sort of particularly light sensitive, it just seems to just and I can understand it occasionally wanting to miss a flash so it can send a dark frame to compensate for any fixed pattern um, noise on the sensor. But this seems to be doing it sort of quite a lot more than I'd expect for that. It just seems to be sort of almost random, so Unless it's maybe flashing a version number or something, I really don't know. Right, so there you have it, some more interesting medical pill camera tech. Not quite as highly integrated as the mirror cam, but then again integrating a uh, 400 megahertz transmitter on a camera chip is probably asking a little bit much and not really necessary. I mean this thing's down to two, two compact boards that just really the reed switch, the antenna, very few passives and really not much else.